Today on The World Today. MI5 bus, uh, boss warns fall of Afghanistan to Taliban likely to embolden terrorists. Second international civilian charter flight since U.S. withdrawal leaves Kabul. Plus, Lebanon announces new government ending 13-month deadlock. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyor Lash Shaboale. The head of MI5 says America and Britain's chaotic pullout of Afghanistan is likely to have emboldened extremists who could be inspired to carry out terror attacks amid fears that terror organizations could regroup in Afghanistan after it was seized back by the Taliban. Ken McCollum stresses that the threat of terrorism in the UK remains real. The director general of MI5 says that although more directed plots from terrorist organizations take time to organize and carry out, psychological boosts for their causes could happen overnight. He adds that 31 late-stage attack plots have been foiled in Britain in the last four years, mainly from Islamist extremists. Six of the plans were disrupted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Security analyst David Otto joins us now for more on this. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. So what do you make of this statement by the MI5 boss that extremists could be emboldened uh, by the withdrawal of foreign forces from Afghanistan? Uh, it's a very critical statement. Um, you know, we've got to remember that uh, tomorrow night is going to be uh, the 9-11 anniversary. So it's going to be 20 years um, since that infamous attack, you know, by Al-Qaeda. So, um, you know, this is kind of a, a warning uh, to each and every country, uh, the intelligence units, uh, to understand that there could be a more robust um, that perhaps, you know, uh, these groups could utilize, especially uh, with uh, coinciding with the Taliban uh, takeover from Afghanistan, you know, again in the same 20 years. Um, I think that said, uh, the, the MI5, you know, uh, it's very, very concerned. Uh, remember that uh, the Taliban government is an offshoot of the Mujahideens uh, that formed Al-Qaeda. And of course, you know, um, Al-Qaeda then, you know, became the father of the Islamic State, which is, you know, the so-called Islamic State, the ISIS movement. Uh, then, of course, you've got other terrorist groups that uh, have emanated from that. Remember, in 2001, we had in Nigeria the... Um, the group that called itself, you know, the uh, Nigerian Taliban. So, um, you know, so many groups, you know, have seen uh, the Taliban as, you know, some kind of uh, an organization to imitate, uh, despite the fact that, you know, there's a clear difference uh, between these groups and Taliban. Taliban was a government, uh, and it has come back, you know, to retake the position that it had before. So I think governments really need to look at this aspect of it, especially the ideological similarities, uh, and see how much they can do to thwart any possible attacks. But how likely uh, do you think the Taliban is to keep its promise not to let any attack against the West foster in Afghanistan, especially when we take a look at the leaders announced this week, which includes uh, people blacklisted by the UN and wanted by the FBI? I think the biggest challenge for the Taliban now that it has come back after what happened to its government in 2001, is to be able to keep Al-Qaeda quiet. Um, but also, as you rightly mentioned, the U.S. had blacklisted the Haqqani network, uh, which, of course, is, you know, what they call the military arm, one of the most dangerous military arms of the Taliban. Uh, then, of course, you've got, you know, ISIS in the Khorasan province, which operates uh, in, in Afghanistan. Now, the biggest concern for the Taliban is the more than 5,000 uh, prisoners that were released. Most of them were, you know, uh, from the ISIS network, from, the, you know, the Al-Qaeda network. How are they going to be able to do this? Now, and this is one of the reasons why the U.S., you know, has then flagged uh, that, you know, some of the ministers of the uh, new uh, Islamic uh, Emirates of Afghanistan government, especially uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who comes from the Haqqani family, is the interior minister, and which means he's in charge of security, especially the 313 Badri um, Special Forces. So these are some of the names that the Taliban has mentioned. Look at someone like Abdul Ghani Barada, 
Uh, he was once, you know, a detainee in Guantanamo Bay. And then, you know, he was released in 2018 to engage uh, in the peace agreement. So a, no a number of them, especially the top guys, uh, you know, are pure Taliban offshoots. You know, these are guys that, you know, um, have fought alongside the infamous uh, Mullah Omar. So it's going to be challenging. But what the Taliban is saying, especially the spokesman, uh, Mujahid uh, Zabihullah, is that the U.S. flagging out, you know, members of its ministry, you know, it's a, you know, somehow, you know, um, it, it defaults, you know, the agreement in Doha. But, you know, um, it's going to be challenging, you know, you know, once, you know, the time comes. Yeah, and, and speaking of the Taliban statement, you know, uh, about the uh, the U.S. position regarding the blacklisting of its leaders, well, they've said that it's a violation of the Doha agreement. At this point, what can the U.S. actually do about this, if anything? I think, you know, you know let's not forget that what the U.S. politicians say um, openly is something different that, you know, the, the U.S. intelligence units, they do. Remember that U.S. You know, CIA director William Burns, you know, was one of the first people to meet uh, with the Taliban in a secret meeting in Kabul. We've also seen one of the U.K. senior intelligence chiefs, you know, say Simon Gass, you know, who actually met with Taliban authorities in, in Doha, in Qatar. And then, of course, you know, the director general of the ISI, which is, you know, the Pakistani intelligence, uh, Faiz Hamid. Um, a lot of them have already you know, met with the Taliban. You know, they've talked with the Taliban. When the Taliban was actually declaring its, you know, government, it invited Turkey, Iran, you know, China was there, Russian officials were there, Pakistani officials, and of course, Qatar officials. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, a politician saying one thing, that of course we don't recognize the Taliban, you know, but of course we do, um, you know, engage with them, which is contradictory. You cannot engage with somebody you don't recognize. Now, the U.S. is saying, you know, um, some of these members, you know, were, have been blacklisted. But the truth is, you know, what, there was an agreement uh, which the Taliban had struck with the U.S. and the government of Afghanistan, which, of course, is, is no longer in power. And, and that agreement was to seek for a peace deal. Now, you know, whether the U.S. thinks, you know, this is the bad deal or they think, you know, the deal has gone wrong, the Taliban is saying it has met its conditions and the U.S. hasn't met its conditions. So it's up to the U.S. But... You know, what is happening on ground is a direct engagement. So any other country that thinks the U.S. is not engaging with the Taliban or not recognizing them, and if they think they want to engage, you know, they should do that in the interest of their own national security. All right, then. Thank you so much for your thoughts and analysis, David. Thank you. And in Kabul, a second international civilian charter flight has taken off from the airport headed for Doha. It's currently unclear how many people are on the flight or their nationalities. It comes after more than 100 people, including U.S. and U.K. citizens, were flown out of Afghanistan on Thursday. Qatari officials who have been assisting the Taliban to reopen the airport say it's up and running again. The Taliban says regular commercial flights will resume soon. And now the UN Human Rights Organization says the Taliban's response to peaceful marches has been increasingly violent, with authorities using live ammunition, batons and whips that have resulted in at least four protester deaths. The Taliban have promised to investigate the incidents. The UN agency also says journalists have faced intimidation while trying to cover the protests. Peaceful protesters across various provinces in Afghanistan over the past four weeks have faced an increasingly violent response by the Taliban, including the use of live ammunition, batons and whips. On Wednesday, the 8th of September, the Taliban issued an instruction prohibiting unauthorized assemblies. Yesterday, Thursday, the Taliban ordered telecommunications companies to switch off internet on mobile phones in specific areas of Kabul. We have seen 
a reaction from the Taliban, uh, which has unfortunately been severe. Um, we've seen uh, the use of live ammunition, albeit there are reports that, you know, um, the, they're firing into the air in, a, in an apparent attempt to disperse the protesters. Um, protesters have still been killed. Um, there have been reports of severe beatings as well. And we've also received reports of house to house um, search operations um, to try to identify those who attended certain protests. And on the humanitarian situation, the World Food Programme says 93% of Afghan families are not consuming sufficient food. The aid ag agency says many Afghans are struggling to feed their families amid severe drought well before Taliban militants seized power last month. And millions may now face starvation with the country isolated and the economy unraveling. Um, the surveys we were doing before the 15th of August indicated that 81% of households were not consuming sufficient food. After the 20th of August, up until the 5th of September, that number went up to 93%. What we have found is that the number of, or the portion of families resorting to extreme coping mechanisms those are things like skipping meals or preferring to give food to children instead of adults or limiting portion sizes to make food last longer have almost doubled. So now there are three out of four Afghan families employing at least one, if not more, of those approaches. Food shortages and job losses are the primary cause of concern for the families that we surveyed. And with winter approaching fast and the economy collapsing, their worries are well justified. It's now a race against time and the snow to deliver life-saving assistance to the Afghan people who need it most. We need to be reaching 9 million people per month by November if we're to meet our planned target of 14 million by the end of the year. We've appealed for $200 million and a number of countries are, have come forward and made offers to, to help but we are quite literally begging and borrowing to avoid food stocks running out in October. And away from the situation in Afghanistan and to the political crisis in Lebanon, a new government has been announced over a year after the previous administration quit following the devastating Beirut port explosion. Najib Mikati, Lebanon's richest man, becomes prime minister, a position he has held twice before. His appointment, along with the naming of a new cabinet, ends months of a political deadlock. In televised comments, Lebanese Prime Minister-designate Najib Mikati's eyes welled up with tears and his voice broke as he described the hardship and emigration inflicted by the political crisis, which has forced three-quarters of the population into poverty. I hope we can rise with this government. I hope we can reach what the people wish for and at least stop the current collapse and together bring dignity and prosperity back to Lebanon, God willing. Lebanon had been without a proper functioning government since former Prime Minister Hassan Diab resigned days after a massive blast on the 4th of August 2020 destroyed Beirut port and the surrounding area. The biggest threat to Lebanon's stability since the 1975-1990 civil war. The crisis hit a crunch point last month when fuel shortages brought much of the country to a standstill. Mikati says divisive politics must be set to one side. He pledged to seek support from Arab countries. Mikati also says that parliamentary elections scheduled for next spring would go ahead on time. Like the outgoing cabinet of Prime Minister Hassan Diab, the new one comprises ministers with technical expertise who were not prominent politicians but have been named by the main parties. The heavily armed Shite Islamist movement is Bola, a political ally of Aoun, which is designated a terrorist group by the United States, named two of the 24 ministers. 
Thanks for staying with us. Some updates from the COVID-19 pandemic update. After lifting all coronavirus restrictions, Denmark is to host Europe's first 50,000 fan concert since the pandemic began. Plus, Australia's New South Wales records its highest caseload ever. Here's the global update. As of today, all pandemic-related curbs in Denmark have been lifted. The country has a vaccination rate of 74.3% and a virus reproduction rate of only 0.7%. On Saturday, the country will host a sold-out concert for 50,000 people, a first in Europe since the pandemic began, and stadiums will be back to full capacity as the soccer season begins have a large proportion of the adult population who are at least... A day after it announced it would soon be relaxing its strict lockdown in Sydney, the government of New South Wales in Australia has confirmed the state's highest caseload of COVID-19 infections since the pandemic began. Despite cases reaching record levels, authorities say Sydney's businesses could reopen once 70% of the state's adult population is fully vaccinated a target due to be reached in mid-October. So far, 44% have been fully vaccinated. In Italy, a new Green Pass system has gone into effect, requiring residents to show proof of vaccination in order to access most entertainment and cultural venues, as well as schools and universities for those who are old enough to get the vaccine. Opponents of the measure are planning to protest in Rome this weekend. And finally, U.S. President Joe Biden has announced sweeping new COVID-19 measures that require workers at large companies to be vaccinated or face weekly testing. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And it's caused by the fact that despite America having unprecedented and successful vaccination program, despite the fact that for almost five months, free vaccines have been available in 80,000 different locations, we still have nearly 80 million Americans who have failed to get the shot. And to make matters worse, there are elected officials actively working to undermine the fight against COVID-19. Instead of encouraging people to get vaccinated and mask up, they're ordering mobile morgues for the unvaccinated dying from COVID in their communities. This is totally unacceptable. The measures also include a vaccine mandate for millions of federal government workers and commerce cases in the country are surging. Hospitals in several states have reached capacity amid the spread of the more transmissible Delta variant. And for more on the U.S. president's plan to get more Americans vaccinated, our Washington, D.C. correspondent, Maria Bird, joins us. Maria, it seems uh, the time for sweet-talking Americans to take the vaccine is over. How is the public reacting to this new mandate by the president? Tineola, you are correct. Um, it is no longer an option. It is being mandated. Uh, the public, those who are vaccinated, are excited. They're glad. You know, they're very concerned about the young children uh, that cannot get vaccinated as of yet, and so they want to have as many adults vaccinated as possible. Um, but for those who are of the unvaccinated, the 80 million that you referenced, um, it is clear that they are not um, very happy about this, especially those. Unfortunately, America has really been built on principles of freedom and you know kind of these you know not really looking at things from a holistic perspective and coming together perspective and so many people are still wanting to you know tout the first amendment rights you know freedoms and they're focused so much on that that they're not focused on how this vaccine could help eliminate a disease a virus uh, that has really taken over and we are now looking at elevated rates of individuals being hospitalized each and every day and obviously these hospital workers are overtaxed and emotionally drained just due to the fact that there are still so many um, that are coming down with the virus and so many that are still dying from the virus. 
So how does the uh, Biden administration plan to enforce this? The Biden administration um, is basically saying that if you are going to not be vaccinated, if you're going to go against what we're saying is a mandate, you're going to be subject to weekly tests. This is not only for um, those who are employees of states, this is for large companies. And so this is now not only going to impact those who work within the government structure, but those who are also in the private industry. And so, uh, and we know that we are on a short list of being able to have enough tests available. And so the, you know, the not the not having the available tests is also going to be another challenge for those individuals uh, who are saying they're going to continue to be unvaccinated because they will be required to have weekly tests. The other challenge, though, that President Biden will face is for those that are not going into a workplace. How will he be able to mandate those individuals who are not going into an everyday work environment where they will be held accountable by their human resource departments? You know, just help us understand this, you know, although vaccines are readily available in the country, uh, the president said 80 million people in the U.S. remain unvaccinated. So what's the problem here? The problem here is, you know, individuals have not seen where uh, they are unfortunately just not trusting the science. Um, unfortunately, the, the FDA approval, they're asking for it to be fully approved. Um, and they are really deciding that what they believe and, and how they feel and the fact that they don't believe, they believe in the conspiracy theory. You know, we unfortunately spent uh, quite a few years prior to President Biden's administration really dealing with some of uh, a lot of conspiracy theories. Unfortunately, we had QAnon, we had all these very extremist groups uh, that have kind of fed into many of the um, brains environments of individuals in the U.S. So many people are beginning to believe some of the conspiracy theories that came out very early on. And then others are afraid. Um, unfortunately, fear has taken over um, and people are afraid of if I get the vaccine, what will my reactions be? Um, those who have said that they never will agree with vaccines. We do have a population of Americans that don't believe in vaccines, period, whether it's a COVID-19 vaccine or any other vaccine. So uh, there's still quite a bit of education that has to be done to address this issue. All right, then, Maria, we appreciate the updates. Do have a lovely weekend. Thank you. And away from the COVID-19 pandemic, top U.S. officials have marked the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks that killed nearly 3,000 people, the most lethal terrorist assault on U.S. soil. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland and FBI Director Christopher Wray led brief commemoration ceremonies in Washington and Virginia for their respective agencies ahead of President Joe Biden's planned visit on Saturday to all three sites of the 9-11 attacks. Two decades. And finally on the program, the World Robot Conference has kicked off in China's capital, Beijing, featuring robots in the service sector and fun toys. Among the robots is a nursing robot that can take people to the toilet, bathtub and back to bed. Officials say the new product is to address the country's increasing aging population. China had 264 million citizens aged 60 and older in 2020, a number set to increase rapidly just as the working population shrinks. Known as one of the major events of the robot industry, the World Robot Conference has been successfully held five times since 2015. More than 300 top scientists from China and abroad and representatives from international organizations are expected. The WRC runs through Monday, September the 13th. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olashibo Have a lovely weekend.